worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. I worship your holy name. So, Lord God, we bless your name. I was watching, um, Lord, I was watching South Park last week and uh, they were at church and the priest said something like uh, we bless your name and then all the people in response to the liturgy of the priest we bless your name they all said oh yep it's a really great name great name Uh, God we do bless your name not because Jesus has a ring to it but because we know what it means And God, if we don't know what it means, I pray that you would tell us right now. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Hey, it's uh, great to see you. Um, You can go ahead and be seated if you want. You can stand up if you want to, John. Do you want to stand up for the whole sermon? I mean, yes, you're good. But anyway, it's great to see you uh, here in person or see you like. I could see you through my spirit online because I know a lot of people will watch online. In case you didn't notice, I was gone the last couple of weeks. That's because I was partying with my uh, kids after Christmas, both here, and then we also uh, went to Seattle to see our son. And in case you forgot, we were preaching through the book of Romans like um, a month ago uh, before before, uh, Christmas. We didn't make it all the way through. I was hoping to make it all the way through by the new year, but we at least made it to kind of Paul's like concluding remarks. We've been preaching through Romans for a year, so it's easy to forget the things that we've said. It's also tempting to think that, you know, the book of Romans is really complicated, and in a way it is, but in another way it is totally not. It's all summed up in Romans 11.32. Hopefully you're getting this through your thick skull. God consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. All to disobedience, that's death and evil. That he may have mercy on all, that's goodness and life. And so just as the prophets say, Romans 14.11, as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow to me, every tongue will give praise to God. Now Paul's quoting Isaiah who makes it very clear that God is promising salvation. He says, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And he's swearing an oath that he will do it. Isaiah 45, 23, by myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word. A word that shall not turn back. To me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear allegiance. So God consigned all to disobedience in order that he may have mercy on all, and that mercy comes to us as a word that is a seed, a word that God swears by, and a word that is also himself. Listen again. By myself, I have sworn. Another way to say all of that is simply say, God is salvation. And of course, that forms a name, and the name is Yahshua, which is pronounced Jesus in English. In John 17, I, I just saw this this week, God tells us, look, the Father, we, me and the Father have the same name. Isn't that something? Well, the book of Romans is as simple as Jesus, and a little child can know Jesus. And a little child can hope in Jesus, while the rest of us really seem to struggle. <laughs> Romans 15, verse 4, this is what we read last time, right, a month ago. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, writes Paul, that we through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Now that means that not only those Scriptures, you know, the sweet scriptures that promise salvation, but all those terrifying scriptures describing death and destruction, they were all written down to give us hope. And now at first, that makes no sense, but if you think about it, it makes all the sense in in the world. If you ignore the painful passages and pretend that God would never allow you to suffer, you can gain some followers. But in a few years, you'll all lose hope. 
Because this world is full of death and destruction. There's just no way around it. But think about it. Isn't that the exact place in which hope grows? Paul continues, Romans 15, verse 8, For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised. Literally translated, Christ became a minister of circumcision to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and moreover, or that is, that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So Paul isn't saying that Christ became a minister to the circumcision, that is the Jews, and to the uncircumcised, that is the Gentiles. Paul is saying that through Christ, just as God promised to the patriarchs, Moses and the fathers, God circumcises hearts. Through Jesus, God circumcises hearts and turns Gentiles into Jews. Okay, next verse. As it is written, therefore I will praise you, literally, in the Gentiles. That's an easy translation that they changed to among. It's epsilon nu in Greek, pronounced in, pronounced in in English. I will praise you in the Gentiles and sing to your name. Now David wrote that, but we know that the king of the Jews is singing that in the Gentiles. It's just what Paul writes to the Colossians. Listen to this. To the saints, that's you guys, God chose to make known how great, literally, in the Gentiles is this ministry, which is Christ in y'all. That's amazing. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Now notice that Paul is quoting scripture. Why? To give us hope, give the Romans hope. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, not some Gentiles, to be clear, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples extol him. Psalm 117, verse 1. And again, Isaiah says, Isaiah 11, 1, the root of Jesse will come. Now, Jesse is David's father's, and so, so, the, so the root of Jesse is the root of David. I am the root and the seed of David, says Jesus at the end of the Bible in the Revelation. So the root is also a seed, actually the eternal seed. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles in him will the Gentiles hope. And then Paul writes this, may the God of hope, he's a God of what? Hope, may the God of hope fill you with all, not some joy, all joy, this is a lot of joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Literally, abound in, exceed all measures, overflow with hope. And as I mentioned last time, 15 years ago, I was defrocked. And some of you were excommunicated along with me for having too much hope. At the time, I was just saying that I hoped that, that it actually meant what it said, that every knee will bow and every tongue will give praise because God would have mercy on all. And the chairman of the committee said, Peter, you can hope it as long as you confess it's impossible. I mean, it still amazes me that I was defrocked for too much hope. And yet, at the same time, I must admit, hope can be utterly terrifying and almost impossible to talk about, although we all have an idea. When I say hope, you have an idea. We all have an idea as to what it is. As I prayed about this all this last week, I kept thinking of this picture, or, or one like it. I kept thinking of a Nebraska cornfield in winter. My grandpa, Ralph, was a farmer in Nebraska. I've told you about him. He's the one that damned all the irrigation equipment to hell. But anyway, a <laughs> couple times around Christmas, my family went back to the farm, and, and it looked like, like death. There's nothing quite as barren, bleak, and desolate as a Nebraska cornfield in, in January. So I kept thinking of this picture and this picture. Usually we go to the farm in July or August. The very same field would look like this. In August, you could walk through the exact same field and it would be literally a banquet of life. I mean, just abundant life. When, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, the corn grew like right at eye level. 
And uh, so you could walk through the field and you could just chow down on all the sweet corn that you wanted. I mean, it was just right there. You just pull it right off the stalk. I actually like it better raw than cooked. Don't know if you, but right off the, I mean, it's really, really good. You could eat and eat and eat and you wouldn't even make a dent in grandpa's harvest. You know, I think that the corn in August was all that much sweeter because we had visited the farm nine months before in midwinter. I knew the corn was a miracle. Well, to understand hope, you have to experience both pictures. Hope is knowledge of life and death at the same time. In other words, hope is the knowledge of good and evil. And so folks that have never suffered any evil don't tend to hope in the good. In fact, you could argue that they don't even know what it is. And now here's a wild thought. According to Paul in Romans 8, 20, God hopes. Well, that's shocking. Because that implies that somehow God suffers or has suffered. God hopes for, as, as Paul writes, God hopes because, as Paul writes, God consigned, listen to this, this is Romans 8, 20, God consigned all creation to futility in hope. Hope requires knowledge of good and evil, and yet the knowledge of evil, the knowledge of evil isn't evil. I mean, once you've gained the knowledge of evil, you can be absolutely filled with the good. So evil is like an empty void. It's not the good, and yet it's the not good ready to be filled with the good. Evil is temporal. It comes to an end, but the good is the end. Hope grows in space and time, and yet hope itself is eternal. Hope abides, as Paul writes. So we experience it here as an empty field, but we will know it forever as eternal life, the very presence of God. You can get real philosophical about all of that, but what I'm saying right now is that hope is knowledge of both pictures. Ignorant people will sometimes say, if you hope that all will be saved, Peter, you're not taking evil seriously. You're not taking hell seriously. You're not taking salvation seriously. Well, I think I've been to hell a bit, praying for some folks who were trapped there in bondage to demons and Satan. So, I mean, I, I know. But you know what was there in those places and at those times? That I learned to hope. It was there that I realized evil is just a problem far, far, far too big for me or anyone I knew. It was there that I learned to hope not in me, or other people, or institutions, or books, or policies, or programs, and procedures, but to hope in God and his word, his living word, Jesus. So hope is knowledge of both pictures, the evil and the good, but not just knowledge of those things, but the way from one to the other. You see, there's only one way, and hope is the way. Jesus is the way. In this hope, writes Paul, that creation, and we are creation, this is Romans 8, will be set free from its bondage to futility. In this hope, we are saved. To hope in yourself and your judgment isn't hope. That is what Scripture refers to as wantonness. And check this out. Wantonness is seizing control of the thing or the things that you desire. The sheep that leaves the shepherd to find the grass is wanton. But the sheep that follows the shepherd does not want. And yet that sheep hopes in the shepherd for the grass and all good things. Hope is surrendered desire, but it's still desire. 
Sometimes I just want to give up, but, but hope is still desire. It's still desire. It's actually an even greater desire. It's a desire so big and so beautiful that you know that you yourself just cannot even begin to fulfill it. And you see, that's what makes hope so painful and apparently dangerous. Surrendering control always feels like death. And maybe it is. My flesh loves control. It does. Institutions love control. And I suspect that's why I was defrocked for too much hope. Maximum hope is minimum control. And that's more than a bit terrifying for everyone, particularly for those in control. And Paul is talking about maximum hope. He's talking about hope even for those who have no hope. It's hope that everyone will hope all things. Maximum hope. And in Romans 5, Paul told us hope does not disappoint us. That's, we read that in Romans 5. So hope isn't just a wish. It's the presence of the future. Verse 12. The root of Jesse will come, and in him the Gentiles will hope. Paul keeps mentioning hope in Gentiles. I once read that Hitler was the very first to define the Jews as a race, and maybe there's some truth to that, but, but I doubt that he was, you know, like the very first. The Jews started as a race. The children of Judah, that's, that's what, it, what it means, who was one of the, one of the sons of Israel, children of Judah, but Paul in all of scripture define Judaism as a faith. And the sign of that faith is circumcision. In Romans 2, Paul told us that one is a Jew inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart. In Romans 11, Gentiles are grafted into the family tree. Why? Well, because we're all circumcised in Jesus, our bridegroom, our husband, circumcised at the cross. Exodus 12, at the start, God told the Israelites that this, that if a foreigner would live with them and desire to eat the Passover, and we know what the Passover is, he, quote, let him be circumcised, circumcised, and he will be as a native, an Ezra, that's a Jew. In Ephesians, Paul, at the start of the letter, refers to the Ephesians as the Gentiles in the flesh, and then by the end of the letter, he says to those very same people, do not live as the Gentiles. So what does Paul really mean by Gentile except one that doesn't fully hope in the God of Israel? In other words, one that doesn't believe. This is my experience, both in seminary and all the other places, that Christians tend to think that Romans is about ending racism between Jews and Gentiles. And then we use it to propose a far more insidious form of racism between those that are destined to believe and those that can't believe. Between those that God loves and those that God doesn't love. Between those that are good and those that are evil. Between those that hope and those that cannot hope and must be subjected to endless torment, unable to hope forever and ever without end. You see, the Nazis are just lightweights next to that. When we read Gentile, I think we're supposed to hear unbeliever. So how do the unbelievers believe? How do the faithless get faith? How do the hopeless hope? How do the unsaved get saved? Verse 12, the root of Jesse, which is also the seed, will come. Verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Next verse, I myself, writes Paul, am satisfied about you. He's talking to Romans. My brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. Now Paul just told Romans, who he hadn't met, that they are full of all knowledge. What does that mean? It means Paul's lying. Or maybe Paul actually believes what he says in other places, like 1 Corinthians 3, when he says, you are God's field. You know, a field of dirt contains no knowledge. Until into that field, someone drops a seed. 
I've always remembered this phrase that I once heard in a sermon. I think it was by Fred Craddock. He, he said, a word contains the future in its bosom like a seed. In every seed, there's DNA. That's amazing stuff. It's all the knowledge necessary to turn dirt into life, to turn it into like a tree. The biggest trees in my neighborhood, ancient cottonwoods, started us, I mean, you've seen a cottonwood. They're the tiniest of seeds. I mean, you don't even see them in the dirt in your backyard. This is my life tree. It's about 50 years old, and I've had to cut it back numerous times in order to keep it in my house in the corner of the bedroom. That's the only place Susan will let me keep it. But anyway, it's a chevalera tree that I got from my grandpa, Grandpa Ralph, when I was in junior high. <laughs> Over the years, I've had to keep adding dirt to that pot because the tree mixes the dirt with light. Remember, God is light. The tree mixes the dirt with light and turns it into life. It's eating the dirt. If there's a seed that turns dirt into eternal life, then a day will come when everything will be life and death will be no more. Well, Paul believes that you are a field. And Paul also believes that Jesus is the seed. He writes, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's a lot of DNA. Romans 15, verse 14. You are filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another, but on some points I have written to you um, very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister, a liturgos. is where we get our word liturgy, like a priest in the temple offering sacrifices, a minister of making sacrifice of the gospel of God so that the offering, that's also a sacrifice, of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul seems to be saying that when he preaches the gospel, he's sacrificing the word. Like a, like a priest in the temple or a farmer dropping a seed in the soil. He's sacrificing so that hopeless unbelievers would then sacrifice themselves in hope. In other words, that they would love as they have been loved. Verse 17, in Christ then, I have literally the boast unto, I have the boast unto God. In chapter three, he remember he wrote, what becomes of our boasting? And then he said, it's excluded. So you have no reason to boast in the work of Mises, but you must boast in the work of Jesus in you and through you, which is the true you. Verse 18, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. Now that's the obedience of faith that he talked about, remember, at the start of the letter. So verse 18, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the disobedience to obedience, the unbelievers to belief, the unfaithful to faith, the hopeless to hope. How? By word, logos, and deed, ergon, actually, it's a word incarnate in deeds by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God. Signs and wonders produce hope. But religious folks make two fatal mistakes in that regard that crucify hope. Either, number one, we try to control signs and wonders. I mean, I totally wish I could control signs and wonders. I mean, after I've seen some of them, I'm like, dang, if I could just put this in my bag and use it, that'd be so great. We try to control signs and wonders, in which case, you see, they're no longer wonderful and no longer signs pointing to God. They're signs pointing to what? Us, number one. Or, frustrated that we cannot control signs and wonders, we start telling folks the signs and wonders, well, they just don't happen at all. In my experience, they most definitely happen. And yet they're incredibly frustrating because I've tried and I just can't make them happen. I've tried. I think that's because, I think I can't make them happen because the point is hope in God, not in me. And, and not a little hope, but maximum hope. God wants you to hope, and not only hope that your back would be healed, but hope that 
all creation would be healed, including your soul and your enemy's soul. If you only hope for yourself, you are hoping yourself right into outer darkness. Let that be a warning. By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way around to Elycrium, that's like Croatia, Bosnia, and stuff, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ, euangelion, the good news, and thus I make it my ambition, literally labor of love, it's this cool word that includes the word love, philos, labor of love, to preach the gospel, euangelizo, evangelize, where we get the word, announce good news, not where Christ has already been named. I love how he says that as if Christ is absolutely everywhere. In Athens, Rome, in your unbelieving neighbor, but just waiting to be named. The word's everywhere. Like a seed lying dormant in the soil in your backyard, or perhaps an egg in a womb waiting to be fertilized by a seed that comes from you. And so the word is in your neighbor, just as Paul taught us, remember, in chapter 10, the word's in your neighbor waiting to be named by the word spoken through you when you proclaim Jesus. That's his name. That's the name of the truth and the logic and the way and the love. It is then that the word, when you name the word, the word rises from the tomb and begins to grow as faith, hope, and love in your neighbor. Verse 20, I make it my labor of love to announce the good news, preach the good news, proclaim the good news, not where Christ has already been named. Perhaps Christ is waiting to be named in every person you you meet. Perhaps you are being called to boldly go where no man has gone before. I make it my labor of love to announce the good news, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see. Has anyone ever told you that those who have not been told of him, those that have not heard of him, are damned to never see and to never understand? So this is what scripture says. Those who have never been told of him will see. And those who have never heard will understand. Sunni Amy. Now, logically, those, right, would be everyone after the time of Paul because no one born yet had yet heard. Or maybe even after the time that Isaiah prophesied these words. But Paul says they will understand, suniemi. It's just a fascinating word study in Greek. It's a word that Paul only uses in one other location in Romans, and that's at the start in Romans 3 when he writes, as it is written, none is righteous. No, no, not one. No one, no one understands. Suniemi. Suniemi is this cognate in Greek. Soon means with, and hiemi means to send or to stand. It, it, it means, the word means to... <coughs> Bring, bring together. It is that moment, you know, when all the facts come together, revealing the meaning. The moment when all the experiences add up to a plot. This is what it's all about. It's the moment when all the elements, carbon, calcium, oxygen, they come together and become a living person and you meet him. You know, you could look at the fruit hanging on this tree and think it's like a set of facts that you could take and utilize and control, but it would be dead. And you would be dead. You would have just gained knowledge of evil. Or you could look at the fruit on this tree and see that he is the life. And then all those facts would come together in a person who is your husband, and you would meet him and know him, for he would know you. That's Suniemi. You would understand. You might even get pregnant. 
When Jesus told the parable of the soils, he quoted Isaiah 6 saying this, this is why I spoke to them in parables, because, or so that would be the, probably the more literal translation, so that seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, suniemi. Have you ever struggled with the parable? Why, God, Jesus, why didn't you just say this plainly? <laughs> why would Jesus speak so that they wouldn't hear, except so that when they do understand, they would also know that understanding itself is a miracle? You know, like a seed coming to life, buried in the soil, like faith by grace, and this not of ourselves, and only faith understands. Those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. Now that's Isaiah 52, 15, and Paul just quoted Isaiah 11, 1, and 10. Verse 1 was, the root of Jesse will come. And verse 10, in him will the Gentiles hope. In between those verses, Isaiah prophesies the most just like incredible hope. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The little child will play over the whole of the cobra, etc., etc., and all will be made new. He's like prophesying that creation will stop devouring itself, and the whole thing will come into this unity. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Why? Because the root of Jesse, the seed, has come. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah is instructed by God to prophesy Israel down to utter destruction. We've talked about that, remember? He used to prophesy them, to, to preachify, preachify them <laughs> until all that remains is a stump. Then God says, the holy seed is its stump. It's as if Israel is the tree, or a false tree, that grew from a seed, but grew in the wrong way. And God has Isaiah chop it down to a stump. But from that stump, from the root of Jesse, grows a new tree in exactly the same spot. I think it's the middle of the garden. And in this tree is eternal life. And hopefully all of that sounds familiar to you. Adam. Isaiah 52, Isaiah prophesies, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes salvation. In Hebrew, salvation is pronounced Yeshua in this verse, which sounds just like the name Yeshua, which literally means God is salvation. In English, you know, it's pronounced Jesus. Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful are the feet of him who publishes Jesus. Isaiah 52, 15, so shall he sprinkle many, or that can be translated even all, goyim, that is Gentiles, he will sprinkle nazah, it means sprinkle blood, like the priests that sprinkle blood on the sacrifice, on the people in the temple, uh, the people of Israel. Isaiah continues, kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. That's the verse Paul is quoting. He's quoting it from the Septuagint, and then that's the Greek translation they read, and it reads just as he quoted it. But they see and they understand Jesus, who is the seed, who is the word that you know and you can speak. And we do speak the word, but we also don't speak the word, right? Why don't we speak the word? Why don't we, you know, publish the word? Why don't we just plant the seed wherever we go, like all the time? Do you know why my grandpa planted the seed? hope. He hoped in the seed. That's why he planted it. So why don't we preach the word? Maybe we don't hope in the word. 
And what is the word? God is salvation. Period. That means God is salvation regardless of you. It's his decision regardless of your decision. So we don't preach to decision. We preach the decision that transforms reality. It's not the dirt that transforms the seed. It's the seed that transforms the dirt, you ignorant dirtbag, you, Adam. <laughs> People say if you hope that God will be saved, you won't preach the word. But it was because Grandpa hoped in the seed that he planted the seed. He, he never came in from the field and said, I, I, didn't, I didn't plant the seed because it just had too damn much hope in the seed. Now, if he hadn't planted the seed, what would have happened? The field would have laid fallow. But the seed would have still been the seed. And the seed we sow doesn't change. It's the same today, yesterday, and forever. That's what Scripture says. It's eternal. Number two, why don't we preach the word? Maybe we don't understand it. You know, I never remember my grandpa coming in from the field crying to my grandma Ivy, saying, oh, Ivy, I couldn't plant the seed because I just don't understand it. And I sure as hell can't explain it. I'm unworthy to plant the seed. I'm inadequate. You know, no one can explain a seed. No one. All our science, no one can explain a seed. But we can begin to understand it if we plant it, a little child can plant a seed. You don't have to know how God saves to announce God is salvation. People will say, Peter, I love what you say, but I don't know how to say it. Well, yeah, you do. Just say, God saves. God is salvation. It's a name. Wrap it up a little like in a seed. It's called Jesus. Number three, why don't we preach the word? Maybe we don't want to get messy. But if you preach Jesus, you'll have to get honest. And that means you have to go to some desolate, painful, broken, and dirty places like a Nebraska field in January. But you know, I never remember Grandpa coming in from the field and saying, Ivy, I, I couldn't plant the seed because well, there's just so much damn dirt and manure. And it was like, Ivy, it was like all broken up and mixed together. How stupid it is to think there's no hope for them. There's no hope for those people because they're too dirty. They're too full of crap. They're too broken. They're like a fertilized field that's just been plowed. And so, well, there's no point in planting a seed in that. Why don't we preach the word? Maybe we think, I can't make it work. You know, that's the temptation of religion. We come to think we can make it work. So if you just say this prayer, take this class, follow this program, we can make it work. But when we build a factory in the middle of the field and make it work, we don't make people, we make false people. And we don't go fruit, what do we do? We make a factory of fake fruit, manufacturing fake fruit. It will draw a crowd at first. But it won't raise the dead or grow faith, hope, and love. So I never remember Grandpa coming in from the field and saying, I, I didn't plant the seed because... For the life of me, I don't know how to make it work. Listen closely. You can't make Jesus work. Just plant the seed. And he will work you. And all the dirt bags around you. But you will have to wait patiently. Like Carl preached about last week. Grandpa never dug up the seed to see if it was working because then it wouldn't work. You can't make the word work, and if you act like you can make it work, you just testify that God is not salvation. And you are salvation, and so you crucify the word, and yet, like I said, it cannot be stopped. It will rise from the dead. It's a seed, number five. So why do we... Preach the word? Why don't we preach the word? Well, it is a sacrifice. 
So if you preach Jesus, you will sacrifice Mises and probably think it's Jesus. And in a way, it is, because he, he dies with you and he rises with you. And this is the really crazy thing about planting seeds. You see, it's, it's really not seizing control. It's what? Surrendering control. Control of the very thing you desire. A kernel of corn is a kernel of food. Or, or it's a new creation and an entire world of food if you plant it. Unless a kernel falls into the earth and it dies, it remains alone, said Jesus. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's what Jesus, the seed, said. Uh, number six, we don't preach the word because we don't hope in the word and know that the word is itself hope. In other words, we don't believe that the word is seed and that we come from that seed. So even our decision to plant the seed is the work of the word. We don't believe the word is a seed. And so what do we do? Blame the dirt. No, I was going to say, I never saw grandpa blaming the dirt, but he probably did, my grandpa. Um, but it's stupid to blame the dirt. We blame the dirt and don't plant the seed. For 1,500 years, most of the institutional church has put their hope in the dirt and stopped scattering the seed. We've blamed the dirt and kept the seed to ourselves, safe in a jar called the church, unaware that the seed is actually that the seed is actually a seed, eternal, indestructible, exceedingly abundant, all-powerful hope. The seed is hope. Romans 5:5. 5, 5. Now hope, writes Paul, does not disappoint us, for this is why hope does not disappoint us, for the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who was, has been, already happened, was given to us. So why does love in us mean that hope will not disappointment, disappoint us? How, how does, why is it love in us that means hope will not disappoint us? Well, because it's love in you that's doing all the hoping. And God is love. That means real love is, is God. And love bears all things, believes, the word is faith, faiths all things, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. Oh, did Paul really mean that when he wrote that? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love does not fail. The seed is not dependent on you. And yet you are utterly dependent upon the seed. Number seven, we don't plant the seed for we don't believe that God has made himself the seed and invited us to share in his joy. All joy. You know, when I was a kid, the greatest honor was when my dad would let me plant the seed. I'd only been around a few years, but I knew the seed was good. Maybe you can tell, I'm hoping that you would hope, that we would hope, and plant seeds of hope wherever we go, wherever you go, where no one else can go. And you see, that is every relationship that you individually have. You can boldly go where I cannot go where no man has gone before, except Jesus. So when people expose a little dirt to you, when they confide in you saying something like, and this happens to all of us, right? They say something like, you know, I feel desolate. I feel kind of barren, broken. I feel like shit. I feel hopeless. Plant the seed. That's when you plant the seed. Sometimes it might just be a hug, testifying that, you know, you have hope for them. Even better, a word. You can just say Jesus. They say, well, what the hell does that mean? It means God saves. God is salvation. That's what it means. 
And if they say, well, not for me, well, then you can start planning scripture. That's what Paul's been doing. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and all are made right by his grace as a gift. Romans 3. You don't have to explain all that. Just have hope and plant it. When you cry, Abba, it's the spirit of Jesus in you crying, Abba. That's Romans 8. The other was Romans 3. God can send all disobedience and may have verse on all. Romans 11. Every knee will bow, every tongue will give praise. Romans 13. Send the Bible. Check it out. Behold, I make all things new, says the voice from the throne in Revelation 21. You don't have to understand it or defend it or explain it. Just plant it. It may get messy. You may feel ridiculous because you can't make it work. You may even suffer the loss of all things. But plant the seed. Because you don't have faith in the dirt. You have put your hope, all your hope, in the seed. In our sermon from Romans 11 entitled, You Can Go to Hell, I told you about the weird experiences that some of us had in our old church building, you know, down on 30th and Vallejo, which we were renting 12 years ago. You may remember this bizarre dark shadow that I, that I showed you before. We recorded it actually on video, then we got rid of it through prayer. I know this is weird. And then we started encountering these weird encounters with ghosts. The last time that it happened, my wife, our cleaning lady, and my personal cleaning lady, I should add, um, she came to get me because she heard weeping on the other side of this door down, kind of leading to this room, this dark crawl space thing under the, the sanctuary just down in the bottom of the church. But to make a long story really short, in that dark room under the old sanctuary, my wife saw these figures just cowering there in the darkness. We had learned that they weren't demons. Demons react violently to the word. They were what the Bible calls phantasma or phantasms, familiar spirits or ghosts, the souls of people who would not hear the word. And so, not knowing quite what to do, I prayed that Jesus would reveal himself, and he did, along with a door that opened up behind him to what Susan described as an entire new creation. <laughs> she saw through, through the door. The other side of the door looked like my grandpa's cornfield in August. <laughs> but on our side of the door, was midwinter. Jesus appeared in glory, and I remember Susan said, Peter, they won't look up. They're still cowering there in the darkness, covering their eyes. And so I just began to tell them about Jesus. In other words, I mean, in no amazing sort of way, I just published Yeshua. I just said stuff like this. He doesn't hate you. He loves you. He's salvation. He came to, to save you. He doesn't condemn you. He has forgiven you. He knows you and he likes you. Look, he makes all things new. As I was speaking, Susan started whispering in my ear. She whispered, Peter, some of them are starting to look up. And the moment that they look up, they see him, and then they rise and they go to him, transformed by him, and then they pass through that door. So what made them look up? It wasn't me. It was hope. Embedded in those words, like knowledge and life embedded in a seed, and I didn't make the life, the knowledge, or the seed. My, my Father in heaven is not dependent on me. He had just given me the wonderful honor of planting the seed so I would share in his joy. And then Susan said this, but Peter, some of them won't look up. See, their hearts were hard. But did you know, and you can trust me because I'm a geologist, 
Did you know that at the surface of the earth, the hardest of rocks will eventually turn to dirt and surrender to the seed? <laughs> the last thing Susan heard Jesus say that day in that room under the stage, in the very spot where I would stand and preach each week, was, I'm leaving this door here for those that will still come. I've told you that story before, but this is my point right now. Just a couple of years before that day, I would preach to about 1,700 folks in a brand new building, and everyone liked me. I mean, do you know how cool it is to tell a joke and 1,700 people laugh? I mean, now it's like, people look at you like, you're insane, or awesome. But now, now, when all this happened, I was preaching to one or 200, and I'd been branded a heretic and felt like an absolute fool because it seemed like nothing I did was working. And yet after that day, I'd stand at that spot, in that spot, and, and I'd remember the spot where I preach, and remember that whether I see it or not, whether I wait a thousand years or just a day, no matter how dirty the dirt, shitty the shit, or broken the broken, the power is in the seed. So put your hope in the seed and sacrifice your kingdom of dirt. Our Father is inviting us to share in his joy. And so the root of Jesse who checked this out is the word by whom all things are created. He took the bread and he broke it saying, this is my body given to you, take and eat. And in the same way after supper and having given thanks, he took the cup and he said, this is the covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you, and do it in remembrance of me. This is the seed. You are the field. Put the seed in the field. And then boldly go where no man has gone before and plant the seed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <laughs> Have you ever uh, listened to some of the songs that we sing? <laughs> we are hungry for you. We are thirsty for you. Isn't that weird? You know, the early Christians were persecuted because the Romans said they were cannibals. And maybe all of humanity are cannibals. Or a wife, a bride. So what is he, food or, or seed? We eat him, <laughs> but he tells us to eat him. We eat him like soil eats a seed. But in reality, the seed is eating the soil. See, the seed is so good, it transforms that shitty soil into life and even more seed. That's how good God is. That's how good the seed is. I don't know if the institution called the sanctuary will ever be big or important in the world's eyes. But you see, what matters is that we plant the seed. For we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And on that day, the thing that will make us lift our head and enter is hope. And so if it comes down to all this stuff or the seed, always choose the seed. Because <laughs> the seed is eternal. And the seed cannot be stopped. And the seed has already conquered. He's just revealing that to us. So that having hoped in him, we would share his joy. Because that's who we are. So in Jesus' name, plant the seed. And I'm so grateful for you, the sanctuary, because you do plant the seed. 
Um, we believe together. And, and we'll talk about this more next week. So for right now, just believe the gospel. You go, what, the ha what is that? Uh, Jesus. Plant Jesus in his name. Amen.